Yes, indeedy, folks. It's the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Well, folks, we have a very, very big day coming up. This most auspicious day, only one day out of the year is like this, happens tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow, June 20th. In fact, it happens at exactly 5.58 according to our daylight savings time clocks, which are the ones we're using right now. And also the ones we're using right here in the Treasure Valley. 5.58 p.m. folks. Well, we can call it six. Five fifty-eight p.m. is the very moment that we slide into solstice. Yes, it's finally here. Solstice. Summer solstice. 5.58 p.m. tomorrow, folks. Be watching for it. Summer solstice. One of the big celebrations of this guy, our buddy, the sun. Over the years, I have met several friends who have heard of solstice, have heard of equinox, have heard of, um, you know, they have a basic idea that the earth goes around the sun and the sun goes um, through the cosmos and the earth is spinning on its axis and all that business. But they just don't really have their mind wrapped around what solstice and equinox mean. So I thought that we would do a little exploring in those issues just because tomorrow is solstice. That is... It is if uh, they're putting these shows on in the order that I give them to them, we'll see. And if not, so what? It's close enough. On June 20th of this year, uh, it's solstice, and that's good enough for me. So today we are going to look at three aspects of uh, solstice and uh, the implications of our relationship with our good buddy, the sun. And the three things that we're going to look at are what causes solstice and equinox. In that, we will also look at why the days vary on them from year to year. There's also what is with that time lag between light and heat. It's so fascinating to me that the longest day of the year is not the hottest day, nor is the shortest day of the year the coldest day. Also, we'll take a little look at the development of the concept of there being only one God instead of um, the traditional, well, my God might be better than your God, but I recognize that there are other gods around. So that gives us three things to look at to enjoy this uh, spacious day of the summer solstice. So the first of our considerations to look at is what causes solstice and equinox. To truly understand solstice and equinox, we have to remember that all of the world is a stage. We get on the stage and things go well, or things go not quite so well. But whether they're going well or not, we can depend on one thing, and that is the great lighting designer in the sky. Yes, folks, the sun is a spotlight. The sun is the spotlight of the stage called Earth. 
daytime, of course, is when the curtains are open and the beautiful spotlight is shining on us while we do our part. And nighttime, of course, is when the curtains are closed. Now, we all understand that actors and actresses can be a little egocentric and a lot of times they want more light on themselves. When this happens, the great stagehand in the sky decides that it's time to go up and find the rheostat on the sun, which is no small thing to do. It's a long, long ladder, and by the time you get there, it would be so hot you'd just burn up. Well, folks, that's why the stagehand always does this at night. So, in the summertime is when the rheostat has been th turned up. And winter is when the actors and actresses have agreed that, well, you know, really, it is getting a little too warm on the stage. I will go with a little less light so that I can be cooled off. I guess you'll have to excuse me. I, I'll, I'll take this call. Uh, hello? Oh, well, hi. Yeah, it's good to hear from you, too. Well, yeah, I am right in the middle of a show here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, I thought that this would be more interesting. Don't you think it's more in No? Well, you're right. The way it is is pretty darn interesting. Well, uh, okay. Thanks. You bet. Uh-huh. Ta. Yeah, always good to hear from you, too. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, that, that was the Great Wahoo. And uh, the Great Wahoo told me that um, despite my best efforts, it might be more interesting if I told you the way solstice and equinox actually happen. So, as much as I hate to get all scientific and everything, let's look at the stage the way it actually looks in space. Well, okay, this isn't the way it actually looks, but it's a representation. Now, we all know about the equator, halfway between the North and South Poles, and we also know probably about the 45th parallel, which is halfway between the pole and the equator. In my demonstration, it's only here in the northern hemisphere, but of course there's that 45th parallel in the southern hemisphere as well. It amuses me that Boise sits so close to the 45th parallel. Boise is at the 44th parallel. It's just smack dab halfway between the equator and the North Pole. What an amazing place to live on Earth. This Treasure Valley is, well, like all of Earth and all of life, is a very unique situation. When thinking about solstice and equinox, we have to remember that what we're thinking about is the Earth's relationship to the Sun. For the sake of my illustrations, let's imagine that we're at about where Mars is, except that unlike Mars, we were standing still, and we were looking at the Earth going around the Sun. When the Earth was on one side of the Sun, it would look like this. When the Earth was between ourselves and the Sun, it would look like this. As the Earth swung around the other side of the Sun, it would look like this. And as the Earth passed on the far side of the Sun, it would look like this. Now, in all these illustrations, you'll notice that the Sun has always stayed right above the equator which would mean that we always had 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night everywhere in the Earth. Of course, it would be hotter at the equator than at the poles, but throughout the year, the seasons would not change. It would always be pretty much like it is on equinox days. But, of course, we know that that is not the case. During the summer, the sun stays around a lot longer, and in the winter, it doesn't stay around nearly as much. 
uh, up at the poles. In the summer, it never sets, and in the winter, it never rises. Here in the Treasure Valley, the sun sets at 10 o'clock during the summer, and it sets at 5 o'clock during the winter. When we get at the bottom of what causes this difference in light, we will be at the bottom of what causes equinoxes and solstices. And the bottom that we're looking for is that my illustration is not the way the world is. Actually, as I'm sure you realize, the world is tilted on its axis. Like this. It's tilted 23 degrees. This tilt, of course, is only in relationship to the sun. In space, there are no ups or downs. There are no tilts or not tilts. Things only happen when you're measuring them in relationship to other celestial bodies. But, of course, on Earth, all of our energy comes from the sun. And for that reason, it's very important what our relationship to the sun is. So, as the Earth goes flinging itself around the sun, there is a difference between the summer and the winter and the middle of the year. This would be summer here in the northern hemisphere. Of course, it's winter in the southern hemisphere. The he southern hemisphere being that which is below the equator, the northern hemisphere being what we call above the equator. A year, of course, is how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun. So, after a quarter of a year, the Earth would be in this relationship where the sun is directly over the equator, what we call the equinox. A quarter of the year after that, the Earth would be in this position in relationship to the sun. This would be in January. We would be in the middle of winter, and of course, they're having warm weather down in the Southern Hemisphere. That is why in Australia and New Zealand, they celebrate Christmas with uh, shorts on. Another quarter of the year, what we call spring, and the sun is back over the equinox as the Earth swings around the far side of where it was in the fall. And then we get back to summer solstice, the time when the Earth is swinging by the sun to where its northern pole is pointed the most directly toward the sun that it ever gets pointed. Just by way of making things more clear, we want to remember that my illustration is not a direct illustration of the action here. You do not need to run to the Arctic or the Antarctic in order to find barber poles. And my illustration is also inaccurate in that it makes it look like the sun gets up over the 45th parallel. This is not true. Remember, we talked about the Earth being tilted 23 degrees on its axis. That means that the very highest point on Earth that the sun reaches where it is directly overhead is 23 degrees north or 23 degrees south. And just to keep things clear, let's point out we are not talking about 23 degrees north or south as we measure the globe. Rather, we are talking about 23 degrees north or south of the equator. These two imaginary lines, 23 degree north and 23 degree south, are called the Tropic of Cancer in the north and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. I'm sure that that is named after the star signs that we have going on at the time the sun reaches those points. Another way to think of it is, if you were on the equator exactly at the moment that the sun goes directly overhead during equinox, and you were wearing a great big sombrero, which would probably be a good idea, the shadow from the sombrero would come directly down you and no part of you would be in the sun. 
during summer solstice, which we're going to be into tomorrow at uh, six o'clock in the evening. If you were the same person wearing the same big sombrero, your shadow would be cast directly down if you were standing exactly at the Tropic of Cancer at 23 degrees north. By the same token, on December 21st, during the winter solstice, if you were standing directly on the Tropic of Capricorn at 23 degrees south, then that sombrero would be shadowing you directly down your body. The day before and the day after these days and these moments of solstice, the sun would be just ever so slightly going back in the other direction. And that is what summer solstice, winter solstice, and our spring or vernal equinox and our autumnal or fall equinox are all about. They are measurements of our relationship with our good buddy, the sun. So while we're considering solstice and equinox, what about the fact that sometimes they fall on the 21st and sometimes they fall on the 20th and sometimes they fall on the 22nd? You'd think that they would make up their mind. To understand this variety that happens from some years to other years, we have to remember that sometimes actors forget their lines. And so, of course, the great god that goes up and changes the rheostat on the spotlight has to, uh, oh, well, you know, before I get a phone call, let's get back to maps, shall we? Several different things affect when the solstices and the equinox fall. One thing that we can be certain of is that the dates of the equinox and of the solstice do not change because the Earth goes faster or slower around the Sun. Yes, Matilda, the Earth is, uh, from what we can tell, slowing down a little bit, but that is a long, slow process, not a fast one, and it doesn't wobble from year to year. The A number one reason that these events occur on different days sometimes is because of our calendars. You know, days are real handy ways for us to measure time, but they really don't make much difference to the earth or the sun. They might be handy for us, and we try to divide the days out to be an even number, but the fact is that the earth orbits the sun every 365 days plus six hours, plus nine minutes, plus 9.7676 seconds. Roughly, this is one quarter day extra every year, which is why we have leap year. Once every four years, we put in an extra day and that makes up for all those quarter days that we've been missing. Of course, before we change the calendar with a leap year, we can be up to three quarters of a day off of what the what our relationship to the sun is. Of course, it can happen that it is during that time that the sun goes over the equator or the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn and we have a solstice or an equinox that falls on one day other than the 21st that it usually falls on. A second thing that can cause a difference in when the solstice falls is because of the world time zones. Because they were the world's leading naval power when all this was being figured out, the world's calendars officially start from Greenwich, England. This means that when the sun does go over the equator anywhere around the world, when it reaches that perfect point where it's going right over the equator, we measure the day of equinox as the day that that is happening in Greenwich, England. This is also the point where we measure full moons and uh, eclipses and everything else that is noted on your calendar is noted when it will happen Greenwich, England mean time. All of which is well and good except that here in Boise and in the Treasure Valley, we are seven hours later 
than Greenwich, England, mean time. That means that something that happens at 3 o'clock in the morning in Greenwich, England on the 22nd of May, and therefore is on the calendar as happening on the 22nd, is actually happening at 8 o'clock in the evening on the 21st of May here in Boise. So, among other reasons, the fact that our calendars are off, that the, there are more than a quarter of an extra day every year, and the uh, difference in our time zones all contribute to the fact that sometimes the solstice or the equinox happen on the 20th, the 21st, or the 22nd. Well, folks, I know I promised that we would also consider what is with that time lag between when it gets light and when it gets hot, and also considering the sun as the original only god. However, that darned beer-drinking guide of yours went and got carried away telling you about the stages of life. So we'll get to these other considerations next week. In the meantime, let's go check out a little bit of Boab. As you remember, last week we went exploring amazing Highway 6, saw lots of trains, and had a good time getting from Spanish Fork down to Green River. After a good lunch at the Tamarack restaurant overlooking beautiful brown Green River, we headed on out toward Moab, and that's where we are going to pick up our story today. From where you leave Highway 70 at Crescent Junction, it is 29 miles down to Moab, and I had noticed that there was a Highway 279 that follows the river just before you get to Moab. I was running a little early, so I figured, well, I'll just go check Highway 279 out before I look for a hotel. early spring and in the middle of the week, I soon learned that around Boab you'll always see people climbing rocks and stopping to look at how they're going to climb rocks. Colorado River, you come across a large potash mine out here in the middle of nowhere. Potash is an impure form of potassium carbonate. Since antiquity, it has been used to make glass soap and fertilizer, still a very important product in our country. One interesting fact about the Colorado River, when the Colorado River is running at its fullest, it is carrying as much water as the Columbia River does when the Columbia is running at its lowest. Here we are at the end of the 12 miles of paved road, looking back at the potash mine. The 
This little road takes off and becomes quite a little drive. I did not take it, and after finding out where it went, I'm glad I didn't. But we will be looking more into this road. Two girlfriends were talking. They were friends from way, way back, you know, junior high school even. And they were having a nice conversation over lunch. And the one of them said, you know, I've just got to be so careful not to get pregnant. Her girlfriend replied, but Jane, I thought you were free from that. I thought your husband got a vasectomy. Jane replied, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> And that concludes this special solstice episode of the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Thanks for joining me. Look forward to seeing you next week when we will go exploring some more around Moab and we will finish talking about what happens with the summer getting hot once the light actually starts getting shorter. And you know your beer drinker, he'll probably find something else to babble about.